Hi, I'm Seben Yaakov. This presentation is entitled A Primer to Resonant Converters. The most popular approach to the design of DC to DC converter is based on a switched inductor. Here shown is a buck converter in which a switch is connecting the inductor to the input and then during the off time the current is passing through the diode and the inductor is actually clamped uh, to ground. So we have an on time and then an off time and the duty cycle which is T on over T, the period, will determine the gain of the stage. In this case energy is passed through the inductor and then discharged into the load. Now resonant converters work in a much different way. They are based on a resonant circuit shown here which typically will include a source and I'm showing here a sinusoidal uh, voltage source, an inductor, a capacitor, and RL represent the load. The energy is transferred from V in to the load through the current which will develop in here which will be a of a sinusoidal waveform. If we sweep the frequency of the source, we'll find that at a given frequency, the resonant frequency, uh, the response will peak and the current through the circuit, this current, uh, will reach a maximum value. Now this is because if you calculate the current as the input voltage over the total impedance, uh, it ends up as an expression like this, and when omega square LC is equal to 1, this term is 0, and you get a peak value of actually V in over R. Now the frequency of uh, this peak will be the resonant frequency, and the angular frequency is 1 over square root of LC, and um, the frequency is 1 over 2 pi square of LC. If we operate at a frequency below the resonant, here's the resonant and we are operating here, the circuit will look uh, capacitive. The reason for that is that at low frequency the impedance of the inductor is low. As we go lower and lower frequencies the impedance becoming smaller and smaller. So we actually look and when we look into the circuit, we see sort of a capacitive nature. Now, in this case, uh, the current will be leading. That is, the current is actually coming before uh, the voltage. So here's the uh, peak of the excitation voltage, and here's the peak of the current, and this phase is actually the leading phase. So the current is coming a little bit earlier. On the other hand, if we operate at a frequency above the resonant frequency, uh, the capacitor impedance is becoming smaller and smaller. So we see here an inductive uh, equivalent, and therefore the current will be lagging. That is, if we look at the peak here, in this case, there is a phase shift in this direction, and the current is lagging after the voltage. This is important because uh, we'll have to take uh, these considerations into account when we decide at which frequency to operate. Now another point uh, to take into account is the quality factor, which is defined as the ratio between the characteristic impedance, which is the square root of L over C, over R, the total resistance in the circuit, and you can also express it as uh, omega sub zero L, this is the angular frequency resonant, L over R. The higher the Q, the sharper will be the response, that is the response of the current as a function of frequency. For a low Q you get a broader response, for a sharp, for a high Q you get a very sharp uh, response. If we replace the sinusoidal excitation with a square wave, then we can look at the square wave as being composed of all the harmonics, and the first harmonic, 
which is shown here, uh, has a peak value, which is 4 over pi times the uh, square wave amplitude, which is about 1.26. This is the square wave here, and this is the first harmonic. A square wave will have higher harmonics. It'll be only odd harmonics, the third, fifth, seventh, etc. The higher the harmonics, the lower the magnitude. In fact, this one is one third of this. Now, since the harmonics are of low magnitude and they are then shifted to a higher frequency, then the response of the circuit to these harmonics is, is really not that sensitive. That is, uh, we primarily see the first harmonic. This is why uh, we can, in the first harmonic approximation, we call it, replace uh, the square wave excitation by a sinusoidal ex excitation, uh, which we assume that is uh, composed of the first harmonics. So now we come to the actual construction of a series resonant DC to DC converter. It's called series because the load section is sort of in series with the resonant circuits. We have the L, we have the C, and then we have this section here. The excitation is a square wave. This is a square wave here, which can be generated by a bridge, like four transistors. And when, say, S1 and S4 are conducting, then we are connecting V in to this line, and this line is then connected to ground. And then when we operate S3 and S2, uh, it's going to be reversed. So we are going to get a sort of a plus minus V in square wave. As we already said, for a reasonable high Q, the current will be sinusoidal. And then what we have here at the output is a bridge rectifier, which actually rectifies the current that is coming here so that the, if it's positive, it's going this way. If it's negative, it's going the other way. And in this case, the load is actually fed by a rectified um, sinusoidal waveform. So the current that is passing to the load we look something like this. Now there is a filter capacitor, which is um, shorting or suppressing the uh, ripple, and we are going to have a pretty uh, smooth DC here, depending on the size of this capacitor. So this is the basic series resonant DC to DC converter. Now regulation or uh, voltage output voltage control is uh, carried out by the frequency. If we change the frequency, we'll, cl the closer we get to the resonant frequency, the higher will be the output voltage. How are we going to analyze this circuit? So let's see what's really happening here in terms of the LC or the resonant component, the reactive component. On one side, we have a square wave. On the other side, we have the rectifier. Now, when looking from the network into the rectifier, we also see a square wave, because depending on which pair of diodes are conducting, uh, we're going to see either plus or minus V out. So we have a square wave here, we have a square wave here, and uh, following the first harmonic approximation, we can say that first approximation calculation, we can replace the square wave at the input by a sinusoidal wave. And then we are going to replace the voltage here by a sinusoidal wave, which will be um, actually developing on some unknown yet equivalent resistance that uh, is placed here instead of this uh, square wave source. So when we have the current IR passing here, it'll develop this sinusoidal wave, which represent this uh, square wave. What about the value of this resistance? How can we 
estimated or calculated. Now, a very clever approach by Dr. Robert Steigerwald was suggested some many years ago. And the idea is the following. If you have the rectifier with the output a DC voltage with a load resistor, and you want to replace it by RE, then the right thing to do is to equate the power that is absorbed by this load and make RE such that it will dissipate the same power. That is, V out square over RL, which is the power of the load, should be equal to I square RMS RE, which is the power consumed by this RE. Well, without going into all the mathematical details, some algebraic calculation here, we end up with this very important relationship which says that the equivalent resistance is equal to pi square, which is about 10, over 8 times RL. So once you know what is your RL, you can replace it by this RE in this circuit. And then you, of course, have a very simple circuit here, which is composed of a sinusoidal wave representing the uh, square wave excitation. This is representing the load. And this is a very simple linear circuit. It's linear as opposed to the non-linear uh, converter, the real converter, which has here a bridge and here a rectifier, which are, of course, nonlinear element. So once you have this equivalent circuit, you can actually uh, express the output voltage, this is the DC output voltage, as a function of the RMS current that will flow here. Well, I have here the derivation, I will not go over it. This, this is the actual result. The output, the DC output, is a function of the RMS current, which is now very easy to calculate, times RL, which you know, and times some constant. By this, you can actually uh, predict what is going to be your DC output or use it in order to uh, design the circuit. We have now a um, bridge here, which generates the square wave. This is the resonant part. We have the load. And um, in this configuration, which is the very basic one, uh, we have a problem in that the load is, is not referred to ground. That is, you cannot ground this point because it's sort of jumping between uh, plus and minus uh, voltage values. In order to make it more practical, normally a transformer is placed here. Now, this transformer serves the purpose of galvanic isolation between the input part and the output part. And now you can actually connect this load to ground or the same ground or a different ground. And of course, this will be extremely useful in the case of a um, offline converter in which this part is connected to the power line and this part uh, which is the device side, has to be grounded to actually Earth. One has to take into account the fact that if you use a transformer, then the reflected resistance that you see when you look at here is not that RE that we have calculated before, but times n square, which is taking into account the turns ratio of the transformer. Now, back to the question, what is the frequency that would be preferred? Will it be a frequency higher or lower than the resonant frequency? Well, in most cases, uh, with MOSFET transistors, uh, it is desirable to, use, to operate at a frequency which is higher they, than the resonant frequency. Well, the reason is that at this range, the current is lagging. And this, as it turns out, helps to achieve soft switching or zero voltage switching and turn off. So let's see how this lagging is really helping us in achieving soft switching, which is of course reducing our switching losses and increasing the efficiency of the converter. Okay, so to understand it, let's assume for a second 
that Q1 and Q4 are conducting. And the current is like this green line here passing uh, from the source through Q1, through the network, and then back to the end. Okay? Now, this represents here the gate of Q4. This is Q4 here, and this is the gate. Now, we're interested in this instance here. This is when the voltage of the gate goes down. Now, if there wouldn't be any phase shift between the current and the voltage, then the current uh, during Q4 being on will be in phase. In reality, it is not. It is lagging. Here it is. So, as we turn off the transistor here, we still have some current. This is very good. Because this current, which is now I'm showing it here, will help to commutate this point, that is to move the point from the ground level, this is the voltage, VDS, of Q4 when the transistor was on, to a higher voltage, because the current is flowing here, it is now charging these capacitors, which represent the internal capacitance of the transistors. Or, in some cases, you can actually add capacitance to even slow this rise even farther. This is the VDS. So, the transistor is actually turned off, and the voltage on it goes relatively slowly up because of this capacitor. And then, the voltage will go all the way up and when it reaches this rail here, V in, the diode, this is the internal diode of Q3. All power MOSFET transistors do have inherent internal diode. Or, in some time, you add an external diode to a, have a faster diode, but at any rate, they do have an internal diode. So, once the voltage goes up, the diode will start conducting. So no, what happens to Q3 is that now the voltage on it is zero because, well, it's one volt, the forward voltage of a diode. So now you can turn on Q3 at zero voltage switching. That is, when the voltage on it is zero. This is very good because it reduces uh, losses and it's very desirable, and this would be a reason to operate at the frequency above the resonant frequency to get the um, lagging current, which helps to uh, commutate the voltage and uh, provide zero voltage switching. The previous converter that we have discussed is the series resonant. Now, there are other ways to uh, realize a resonant converter. One of them will be the parallel resonant converter. Parallel means that we connect the load in parallel to the capacitor. So it's possible to put the load in series with the LC or in parallel to the capacitor. The differences between them are primarily in the subject of output impedance of the converter. Uh, this is a subject that I'm not going to discuss here. Another variation that you'll find is that there are converters that are based on one inductor and two capacitors, that these are called LCC. And another variation is one capacitor and two inductors. This will be LLC. And the, in here, the load is in parallel to one of the inductors. The advantage of these topologies is that the relationship between the frequency and the gain is more desirable. In particular, uh, you need a smaller range of frequencies to get a given change in the gain. As, com as compared to the regular uh, resonant converter, that uh, you need a fairly large frequency a change in order to control the gain. So these are the advantages of these uh, uh, 
a converter, which I'm not discussing in this presentation. Uh, let me just point out that the LLC is becoming rather popular recently, and there are many uh, control chips uh, for uh, building uh, such a converter. This brings me to the end of this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and that uh, you'll find the content uh, useful in the future. Thank you very much.